Good morning, Cam One. Today we're going to talk about something that you're familiar with, which is the scientific method, and also something you probably haven't encountered unless you've taken physics, which is significant figures. The scientific method is just a way that scientists, whether they're chemists or physicists or anyone, kind of goes through the scientific process um, to make that process consistent, to make sure all scientists all over the globe are doing everything the same way, systematically. The first thing that's going to take place is you're going to make some kind of observation of a phenomena using one of your five senses. You're going to look at something in nature or look at something in a lab setting and you're going to ask the question, what's happening here? Why is this happening? Um, during that observation period, you could be making two different types of observations, qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative observations or qualitative data is always going to involve words or descriptions, things like color and odors. Quantitative data is going to use quantities or numbers to tell the story, so a length or a volume or anything that you can directly measure with a device and record with a number would be quantitative data. Both types of data can be helpful depending on what you're observing. After you've made those observations, you're probably going to come up with a hypothesis or a tentative explanation, an educated guess to why this event, this event is occurring. After you've made that hypothesis, it's time to test the hypothesis through an experiment. Uh, for the sake of talking through this slide, let's come up with an experiment that we want to test. Let's suppose I task you with coming up with an experiment that will test the merits of cow manure as fertilizer and miracle Grow as fertilizer. And your job is to see which one's the better fertilizer. So what you would do to set up a controlled experiment would be to have one potted plant with cow manure as a fertilizer and one potted plant with miracle Grow. We call the cow manure and miracle Grow since that's what we're researching, we call that the independent variable. It's independent of everything else and it's what we're studying. The dependent variable is the thing we're going to observe. In other words, what's going to change because of the variable that we put on the, the different experimental groups. And in this case, plant growth. Um, you could measure how high the plants grew. You could measure how much fruit they produced. All kinds of different things. Also within the experiment, we're going to have constants. Constants are things that are the same in every group. So for instance, we only want to know about the fertilizer. So we'd want to make sure they both get the same amount of sunlight. We'd want to make sure they get the same amount of water. Um, they have the same type of soil and the soil pH was similar. All those things we want to make sure they're the same in every group so those wouldn't be manipulating the results. Finally, we'd want to make sure to have a control group. We'd need to compare the cow manure and the miracle Grow to some kind of standard to make sure that they're beneficial at all. So we would have a group that doesn't have any fertilizer on it and just has the other constants applied to it so we can compare back to them. We call that the control group. I understand you know a lot of this stuff and you've heard a lot of before in physical science or even elementary school. We're just kind of going through it quickly to make sure we're all on the same page. So just in review, independent variable is what I change, the dependent variable is what I observe, and the controlled variable is what I keep the same. After we've done the experiment, it's time to analyze the data. We're going to take that data, collect it, um, and kind of try to come up with ways to interpret that. We might even come up with a conclusion about which fertilizer is the best. That probably wouldn't occur until we've done multiple tests over and over again to make sure that our data um, supports our conclusion. We might even have to take, change our hypothesis. If our hypothesis originally was the cow manure is the best fertilizer, we might have to change that depending on our results. Finally, this wouldn't happen until several renditions of the scientific method went through, but we might get to a scientific law or scientific theory. Um, this would be things that would be developed over long periods of time and people a lot of times have a difficult time deciphering the difference between these two things. So let's go through them. A scientific law is an ex explanation of an observed phenomenon. In other words, it's used to predict results and it's generally held as true. So for instance, gravity is a scientific law. If I, drop, if I had an apple in my hand and I dropped it, everyone would, watching would expect it to fall to the earth because earth is a large mass body that has lots of gravity. That's the law. It's an explanation. Gravity is the explanation for what's going to happen. 
A theory then attempts to explain the law. It attempts to give a logical explanation of why the law is occurring. Well, why does gravity exist? Okay, why does humanity exist? Where did we come from? Okay, those are theories. So um, Einstein came up with a theory of relativity which described how gravity was like basically working in space-time to basically pull things to larger bodies. All right? um, if you look at this picture, um, this ren rendering kind of shows kind of how Einstein's theory of uh, relativity worked. And you can see like that a large mass body would create a dent in space-time or curvature that would cause orbits of planets and things moving toward it, okay, depending on their uh, movement. We're not going to get all into the physics of that, but that's kind of a good example of the difference. Gravity is the law. The explanation for gravity, Einstein's general relativity, is the theory behind that, or one theory behind that. So as we go through the scientific method, measurement is going to be very important. And it's going to be important that we have reliable measurement. I wouldn't have you do a, if I had you do an experiment where length was important, I'm not going to hand you like a pencil and say, oh, just measure it in pencils. No, I'm going to give you something, a good measuring device, like a ruler with millimeters so that you can get precise, accurate measurements. So let's talk about the difference between those two words. Accuracy is how close you are to the true value, um, where precision is how often you can do it over and over again. So you can have one measurement that is accurate, but you need multiple measurements to show precision because it's doing the same thing over and over and over again. One way to think about accuracy and precision is kind of think about throwing darts. And if we use a couple different analogies, it kind of helps us understand the difference between those two terms. So for instance, if I wanted to throw darts accurately, but not precisely, then what I would do is I would be close to the goal every time, but not necessarily in the same spot. If I was going to throw something with precision, but not accurately, that would mean that I'm repeating the same thing over and over again. I'm just not hitting the target, or I'm just not close to the actual measurement. And then obviously, if I wanted to do both, it would be being able to measure accurately over and over and over again. The way that accuracy and precision represent themselves in measurements is through something called a significant figure. A significant figure is a measured digit. So in other words, if I use a meter stick and say, how far, how wide is this room? And you measure five meter sticks across the room. The five is a significant digit. It was a measured number. The problem is, is most of the time it's not exactly five. We have like, you know, decimals that show us um, more digits that were actually measured with a device. So a significant figure is any digit that was measured with the device plus one estimated digit. And we'll kind of show you how that works. Significant figures are a measure of accuracy. Typically, the better type of measuring device you have, the more accurate you're going to be able to be. So for instance, if I have you measure the length of this room with a meter stick, you might be able to get down to the hundredth of a meter because you have lines on that meter stick um, that are all the way down to a millimeter, so maybe even farther than that. Um, but if I say just pace it off and you say like, well, it's seven paces or um, a pace is about a meter, you're less accurate because your measuring device, your stride, is not, does not have as many fine-tuned measurements. So let's take a look at what this would look like in the real world. If we look at this first line, you can see that the first the ruler only is has the length of the ruler, which is 100 centimeters. So we can tell the hundreds position, and we can estimate one more, which is in the tens position. So we know this for certain, 100, and we can estimate then the tens based on the hundred scale we have. So I would call this about 20. So we could only measure to the tens position. We call this 20 centimeters. You cannot put 22 because then you'd be estimating both the tens position and the ones position. In this next ruler, though, we have lines that have been measured to the 10 centimeters, meaning we can record the 10 centimeters with certainty. It's 20. 
and we can also record the ones position based on estimation. So you could call this 22 centimeters or 23 centimeters. I'm less concerned that we're all estimating the same and more concerned that you have the correct digits placed there. So if we look at this last one, what you're really doing is seeing what each value of the line is. So this line to this line is one centimeter. Since each line is valued at one centimeter, I can estimate one dig digit place past that. So this is one, two, three, so 22, and I can estimate one digit past that. And you might call that 22.2 centimeters, 22.3, 22.5. But the idea is, is I can estimate one more digit past what my device shows that I can measure. We will work more on this in lab. Another big part of measurement is being able to identify those significant figures in a measurement and then do mathematical operations with them, like when you're calculating an area or a volume. So it's very crucial that you can identify which numbers are significant and which ones aren't. So let's go through that here real quick. Number one, if it's not zero, it's significant. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all of those would be significant figures. So what that should tell you is the sticky point in all this is the zeros. If it's a zero, sometimes it's significant and sometimes it's not. So let's look at some different scenarios here. If the zero is what we call trapped, Meaning, like sometimes in class I'm going to refer to, that's a trapped zero. What that means is, is there's non-zero digits on each side. And so that zero there is not an estimated digit. It is a measured digit and therefore it counts. So this number right here would have one, two, three sig figs. And you can abbreviate SF. 10,002, these are trapped zeros. So the non-zero digit counts and the trapped zeros count. So this would have five sig figs. And then finally, we see two here and three on the end. So this would have four sig figs, All right? If the zero is trapped, it's significant. The next issue would be trailing zeros. If in, in other words, if it, a zero is on the end of a number, Zeros that are trailing are significant if a decimal is present. So if you look here, here's a decimal. So that means that the scientist was trying to tell us that this zero was measured. And therefore, this would have two sig figs, the two and the zero. This number 2000 here, these zeros here, there's no decimal. And therefore, the scientist is trying to let us know that those zeros were simply placeholders and that they were not measured. So the only significant digit in this number is the 2. This is the same number. I think we were, having, we're supposed to have a decimal here. If you have, now that there's a decimal, those zeros are significant and they were measured and therefore four sig figs. This is a trapped zero, so it counts. This is a trailing zero without a decimal, so it does not count. So this has three measured digits or three sig figs. Finally, at the bottom, there is another way to show significance, which is a bar. Um, this first number, we've kind of already done one like this, would be one significant figure. But if we put a bar over one of the zeros, we can show significance to that zero. So this one has two sig figs, the one and the zero that's covered. This has three, the one and the zeros that go all the way up to the bar. And this one would have four. So basically, if you put a bar over a zero, everything to the left of there would be considered significant. This doesn't happen very often, but it is helpful to know if you have some zeros that are trailing that are significant and some zeros that are trailing that are not. This is a little like what we just said, which is that um, if a zero is past a decimal place, as long as it's a trailing zero, it would be significant. So this one, once again, these are trailing zeros and there's a decimal here. So this has two sig figs. There's no trailing zeros here. These are called leading zeros. We'll get to those in a second. So this only has one sig fig. This would have four. And this would have, nope, nope, nope. And those three would count. So this would have three sig figs. So if it's a trailing zero and it's after the decimal, it's significant. Leading zeros 
zeros that are in front of the number, there should be a decimal here, those are not significant. So this would have one sig fig, and this would have two. Another thing to know with significant figures is that you're never going to get significant from known quantities. For instance, you know that a dozen equals 12. Well, that 12, that 1 and that 2 were not a measured quantity. It's just a known equality that 1 dozen is equal to 12, or that 60 minutes is in 1 hour. Therefore, we don't look at those numbers and get significance from them or figure out how many of those digits were measured. Um, that will come into play when we start doing more math. Also, with scientific notation, um, let's say we have a number like 4.0 times 10 to the 4th. To find significance, we're just looking here. We completely ignore this, so this would only have two sig figs. We just look at what we call the M factor. That's the only thing that we're really paying attention to there. All right, there is a simple trick here. I know I just told you a bunch of rules. There's a simple trick that I use that basically says if you have a decimal, start from the left, and if you don't, you start from the right. Um, this is kind of a little graphic, dot L, R, and it kind of helps me remember, okay, if there's a decimal, start from the left. What does that mean? Well, you're going to move toward the number, you're going to stop at the first non-zero number, and you're going to count all the way to the end. So if we look at this first number, 390, it has no decimal. That means we're going to start at the right, we're going to move toward the number, and we're going to stop at the first number that's not zero. And we would count the nine and the three, and therefore two sig figs. Notice that I skipped over that trailing zero. It's because there's no decimal. Same thing with B. I, this has no decimal. I start from the right. I skip over these trailing zeros, and I count one, two, three, three sig figs. In this next number, 0 0.0078, there is a decimal. So now it's going to start from the left. And as I move, I get to the first number that's not 0, which is 7, and I count 1, 2, and this number has two sig figs. The reason we're skipping over those zeros, if you recall from the rules, is because they are leading zeros, and they never count. D has trapped zeros. It does have a decimal. You could just start from the left and stop here at the 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Once again, there's a decimal there, so one, two, three, four sig figs. All right, you'll get better. This is a trailing zero, and there's no decimal, so I'm going to start here. One, two, three, four, four sig figs. This scientific notation, we're going to ignore this, and we're going to go one, two, three, three sig figs. Okay, I just want to show you one quick thing here before we move on. Look at M, N, and O. M has no decimal, so we'd come from the right, and we wouldn't start counting till the 2. That has one sig fig. This 200 milligrams has a bar. What that means is the 2 is significant, and this is significant, but this is not. Therefore, that would have two sig figs. And then here's 200 with a decimal, which means we'd come from the left, we'd start counting at the 2, we'd count all 3, and this would have three sig figs. So there's, an exp there's a circumstance where you have three different numbers, or well, they're three same numbers, but because of the way the scientists wrote them down, they're showing that their measuring device had different levels of precision, precision and accuracy. In the near future, we are going to start doing math with significant figures. It is going to be critical that you know how to round off numbers correctly. So for instance, if you look down here at the bottom, the rounding rules are the same as you've known in the past. A 5 and up would round up, and a 4 and below would round down. The key that you need to know is that how many significant figures you're rounding to. So for this first one, we want to round to three significant fi figures. So we're going to take the first three numbers, then we're going to look next door at the 4. The 4 is not big enough to round the 9 up, so we'd have 2.89 meters. 78.367. If we look, we got one, two, three that we're going to keep. The six will round this up, and it would be 78.4 liters. One, two, three. The eight will round this up, and we'd get 111 seconds. Those three are pretty straightforward. The one that gets tricky is this one over here. It's not tricky. You just got to think about what's going on. We're going to keep these three. This nine is going to round that up. I will tell you right now, the mistake that everybody will make is they'll put 4 milligrams.
because they know the value is 4. The problem is you didn't record 3 sig figs, you just recorded 1. You need to keep those zeros there. They are significant. They were measured, and therefore you need to show them. 4 in this class is not the same as 4.00. They are measurements, and they have significance. Great job today going over the scientific method and measurement. Um, we will have lots of practice with significant figures. It takes time for you to kind of absorb what's going on there, but we'll um, keep going forward. Let me know if you have any questions. We will see you next time.